Good afternoon. Welcome to ELL Plus with me, Nina Bowen. And me, Samuel Koshi Aiden. We'll be bringing you news and features from around the boroughs. Croydon and Lewisham, Tower Hamlets and Hackney. In this week's programme, another West deal gets to go ahead. After Shepherds Bush and Stratford, Croydon is all set for a new £1.5 billion shopping centre. Students march through London calling for free education funded by higher taxes and the abolition of tuition fees. Hackney Council heads for legal confrontation with the government over publication of its newspaper Hackney Today. And wrapping up warm for winter, commuters donate their coats to help the homeless. The regeneration of Croydon Town Centre took a big step forward this week when the Council's Planning Committee approved a £1.4 billion scheme to build London's third Westfield shopping centre. This is the projection of the future Westfield Centre to be built in Croydon that's just been given the green light to redevelop the two shopping centres already there. Stratford and Shepherd's Bush have both had huge success with their Westfield Centres. Here we can see how the Shepherd's Bush expansion is going and also the scale of the centre itself. The centre will cost £1.4 billion to develop and the council says it will keep a close eye on the project, but that is fantastic news. Building the new Westfield will create over 7,000 new jobs. The work won't start until 2019, but this announcement is the first solid move towards the redevelopment. New research from Goldsmiths University of London shows that pollution levels in South East London have reached six times the World Health Organization's daily guidelines. Earlier, I spoke to Professor Jennifer Gabris, who's been overseeing the study, and asked her how the project began. Since the autumn of 2016, we have been uh, monitoring air quality with residents of South East London, and we've been using a device um, that we've made called the Dust Box, and it measures particulate matter 2.5. So we've had about um, 30 of these running in locations across Stepford and New Cross. Um, and now we've looked at the data. Um, we brought in all of the monitors in September of this year. And we developed data stories. They're called Deptford Data Stories, where we look at seven key locations um, and pull out kind of significant patterns of pollution or also low emissions across the area. So the latest research is um, has some surprising findings and as well as findings you might have expected. One is that major traffic intersections are really um, key and significant sources of air pollution. The highest spots in our network were across uh, New Cross Gate um, and also at Deptford Bridge by the DLR station. So there are major road intersections, A2, A200 and so on. Um, and that's where we found some of the levels that were six times or more World, World Health Organization guidelines for 24 hours. Um, another significant finding is that the River Thames is a likely source of uh, emissions. We had several monitors at the Peeps um, area of our uh, lo location, and um, there we were seeing levels that were four times the World Health Organization guidelines for 24 hours. Um, and a surprising finding is that sheltered and uh, garden spaces and pedestrian-friendly streets have much lower levels um, of emissions. So our kind of takeaway from that is that urban design can make a big difference in relation to air quality as something that could complement current efforts to address uh, diesel emissions and so on. From what I understand, this is um, a traffic way that is managed by the Port of London Authority. Mm -hmm. So there's a question uh, how much the Mayor of London can do in relation to managing um, that space. So what we're doing next, we have a whole set of actions that we've um, listed at the end of the data stories, and those have been developed very much with the participants um, in the study where we've had uh, workshops, where we talked about the preliminary findings and what they would like to do going forward. So now we're talking to many community groups about uh, different campaigns and initiatives that they have underway, from planting trees in Evelyn to um, trying to preserve a green space by Creekside um, and any number of other things related to transport um, where groups are working with SusTrans to improve cyclability. This week, two men were jailed after being found guilty of murder. Jaleel Rose, who's aged 21, and Jack Harvey, who is 17, were sentenced to 25 and 19 years respectively for the murder of Scotty Kubietra last year. 
Scotty Cubietra was fatally wounded after being attacked on Halloween night in 2016. He had been setting off fireworks with friends in a Croydon park when he was chased by a group of men. Last night, police released CCTV footage which showed the victim moments before he was stabbed. Police say they're still looking for others who may have been involved. I would say that we believe they were up to eight involved uh, in the incident that caused Scotty's death. And absolutely, even though we've found two people guilty and they've received strong sentences today, we are very much interested in anyone who's got information as to who else was there that night. We know there are other people there. We know that people know who was there and who did this. And if anyone has got information, then yes, we're very much still open to receiving that and acting on it. A new food waste collection service was launched last month in Lewisham. 80,000 new food waste bins have already been delivered to residents, but there have been problems. Some residents say they haven't had their new bins yet, while others claim theirs are not being collected on time. Lewisham Council says it plans to collect bins once a fortnight, but as you bin Jiang has been finding out, some residents have complained they're having to wait even longer. Enjoying a great meal is a wonderful thing but leftovers can be a huge contributor to landfill. Lewisham Council collects food waste once every two weeks, but since October, collection times for most households have changed. Around 80,000 homes have received their recycling bins, which include two outdoor food waste bins and a small cereal bin for the kitchen to get rid of a family's daily food waste. This service started one month ago. Thousands of people have received their kits and are using them every day. Most of residents are really satisfied with this new service. However, they do have some problems. For example, there are still 27 roads where food waste have not been collected yet. On Twitter, people have complained to Lewisham Council account some tweets said that the bins hadn't even been delivered yet. Worse still, some said that their bins were not emptied by the given collection times, and they had waited for more than two weeks. During that time, they found frogs, rats, and foxes raiding their bins. The council said in a statement that any resident experiencing issues with their food waste collection should email Enviro Casework at lewisham.gov.uk. They said that the reason some roads and estates were excluded from the food waste collections was because they were on a red route or did not have the space for bins. And they added, information about the food waste and fortnightly black bin collection can be found on the website at www.lewisham.gov.uk forward slash waste changes. The food waste collection is aimed at increasing recycling and saving money. But unless this new service works properly, there will be a negative effect on the local environment. Yu Bingjiang for ELL Plus. This week, thousands of students marched on the streets of London. Go back to your campuses and organize with whatever group you're part of. They were demanding free higher education following increased university fees in the last year. Studying in the UK can be very expensive, and the majority of young people struggle with university debts long after they've graduated. Campaigners reckon they're close to achieving their goal. I think we are on the cusp of achieving free education. Our vision of an education system which is free, liber liberated, democratic and accessible to all. This week saw the Advertising Standards Authority weighing into the argument over how universities market themselves to students. Six universities were told to scrap their marketing campaigns for making misleading claims over rankings. The six were Falmouth, Leicester, Teesside, Strathclyde, East Anglia and the University of West London. The ASA is issuing new guidelines to universities to make sure they abide by the UK advertising laws. To explore some of the issues, we were joined earlier by Blair Campbell, who's Head of Student Marketing here at Goldsmiths University of London. Just to make it clear, Goldsmiths is not one of the universities singled out for criticism, but we started by asking him how important it is, the ASA ruling, to the higher education sector as a whole. 
in the sector we as universities already know, which is that things are increasingly competitive and universities are, are trying harder all the time to find really compelling statistics to use and, and to present them um, to, to, to audiences such as potential students. And I think what, what it really highlights as important is, is that there's a need for care and diligence there and that universities need to think carefully about how they're interpreting those statistics and how they're presenting them back to people. Mm -hmm. And how important is it um, do you think for universities not to oversell themselves? I think like any organisation or anyone doing advertising, you know, you have to be careful to be authentic and, and mm -hmm. true um, and not to say something that's perhaps ambiguous or even, even worse, misleading. Um, and I think it's important, you, students are making a, an important decision in their life here and, mm -hmm. and, and again, what the, what the ruling, what, what the, 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 the case is highlighted, I think underlines is that there's, a, there's that care needed from universities just to check, just to make sure that what they're presenting isn't in fact misleading someone or perhaps um, yeah, overstating the mark. To what extent do rankings matter to students when they're applying? I think it's an um, almost impossible question to answer. I'm not really sure anyone knows. Um, certainly in the sector, if you talk to other universities, there's a lot of debate about whether students in fact care um, about rankings. I mean, I think what we'd all agree um, as universities, uh, that we think we know, if you like, is that the further down the decision-making journey students get, mm -hmm. then the more important those kind of things can be. So you're going from a long list of potential places to study to three, four or five institutions, and when you're choosing between that small handful, um, then those kind of statistics and rankings could be quite influential. And I think also there's um, a, a view that uh, parents, influencers, teachers, advisors, those kinds of people can also um, take a lot from, from a ranking or statistic mm -hmm. too. And isn't it hard for students making up their minds when there's different methods of ranking depending on the course and the university? Yeah, it's really hard. And I think everyone um, in, in the sector, and we certainly worry that, that there's too many. There's too many mm -hmm. league tables, there's too many bits of data, there's too many different ways of, of um, carving up the cake, if you like, and, and ranking institutions. And I think um, that's, that's a concern. We all spend a lot of time as universities in heavily invested in providing that data. But it's also a concern in the sense that um, students can maybe be confused simply by the volume and different types of information. And I think that's maybe where you've got universities trying very hard, hopefully with good intentions, um, but perhaps have oversimplified something that is actually quite complex um, and have expressed that in a slightly clumsy way back to their audience. That was Blair Campbell from Goldsmiths. We'll take a short break now. We'll be back in a few moments, so stay with us. Welcome back to ELR Plus. A legal battle is looming in Hackney. The government is threatening to take the local council to court over its controversial publication Hackney Today, which is delivered to every home and business across the borough. Monica Ghosh has this report. Under the 2011 Publicity Code, councils must not publish their own newspaper more than four times a year, but Hackney Council publishes theirs twice a month. The regulation was strengthened again in 2014, but the council have persisted, saying that it's the cheapest way for them to get information out. Hackney already has two well-established local papers, The Citizen and The Hackney Gazette. The council has just over a week to comply, and if they don't, they could see themselves in court. I spoke to Gareth Davies, an award-winning ex-local journalist who now works for the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. I asked him if he thought competition was a good thing for local journalism. Um, it's a good thing for readers and it's a good thing in terms of the stories and the quality of local journalism because it kept us on our toes and we produced better journalism as a result. It's, it's less positive in the sense that it, it, it's already a, it's a very crowded marketplace um, and it's very competitive and there are, less, you know, there are less readers anyway in terms of picking up the physical product. So, and I don't know if you're aware of the Hackney Today situation. Have you read the council's bi-weekly paper, The Hackney Today? I've not read it, but I'm aware of the issue. And what do you think about the paper? Do you think it shouldn't exist and that it should be a quarterly as by legislation? Or well, first of all, if the law is a law and guidance from the, from the government is what it is, and it should stick to that. There was a reason it was brought in. You know, the company's got a spin, they have a, they have a slant, and all these, all these stories have gone through, not just one council upset, but numerous councils have been run through. It's the news exactly how the council would want you to read it. With just a week to go, Hackney Council has a very short time in which to decide how it communicates with their borough. Monica Ghosh for ELL Plus. 
now news of a major accolade for last year's television journalism students at Goldsmiths. They've been shortlisted for no fewer than four awards by the Broadcast Journalism Training Council. It's the largest number of nominations for any university. Education last year, like this year, was in the news. Thousands Two students were shortlisted for the best TV news item for their coverage of a national demonstration. Saturday. Now we have the Goldsmiths Union for students here, as well as other societies, and at the moment we are all heading towards Millbank, where there will be a rally and various speakers talking about exactly what we're protesting here today. A documentary about forensic nurses helping rape victims in South Africa is the running for best original story. The Zalake Centre is a centre where we turn victims of domestic violence into survivors. One group made a heart-hitting film about how the Irish government and the Catholic Church combined to hush up ill-treatment of unmarried mothers. That's been shortlisted for the best TV documentary. I always had an intrinsic bewilderment from Berlin that all isn't what it seems. Hello and welcome to... The and the whole class is up for Best TV News Day Award. Well, certainly Trump's uh, presidential win in the US, but uh, to a certain extent, uh, Brexit. The award ceremony will be on November the 28th at BBC Media City in Salford. Now it's time for our regular look at what's happening on our sister website, East London Lines. Joining us now is Sophie Saul, who's part of this week's MA Journalism team. So, Sophie, there's been a lot of international news around this week, um, but your focus is local news. Um, to what extent is this a pretty busy news area? Well, there's always something going on, whether it's international or local, mm -hmm. um, and we cover all sorts of media sites, keeping an eye on what events are going on throughout the week. But then, of course, when you then go out there, interview people, talk to people, it always produces even more coverage and news stories available. I see that you've been covering the pollution story, which was covered earlier. Um, have you managed to get any local reaction? Yes, uh, this morning, actually, I visited Deptford High Street and spoke to some local residents there, um, who most of whom hadn't uh, heard about this report. Um, but tomorrow, we've got a team of people from the Lewisham Borough area uh, who are going out to do some Vox Pop interviews uh, with some community members. Good. Um, and now about the Prince Harry story. He continues his late mother's work promoting HIV awareness and testing. What have reporters been doing on that story? Uh, so we have one reporter who went down to a pop-up in uh, Hackney, um, I think it's Hackney Walk Shopping Centre, and she did a live report uh, on Facebook Live um, showing what the pop-up is about mm -hmm. um, and covering the information there. So, and it's HIV Awareness Week coming up, so. Okay. And what else do you have up and coming? Uh, we have an interview up and coming with um, Joshua Coombs, who is uh, f uh, internationally renowned now for a campaign called Hashtag Do Something For Nothing, which provides haircuts for um, homeless people, but it's also encouraging other people who uh, want to get involved with Hashtag Do Something For Nothing. So, Viso, thank you very much. Thank you. One year on from the fatal Croydon tram crash, drivers and tram operators are still in dispute over the installation of new safety equipment. The drivers union had threatened to go on strike this week, but industrial action was called off as discussions continue over new infrared sleep detectors. The special sensors were introduced last month, and Transport for London insists they've been fully tested by the drivers' union, but the drivers, but the drivers union isn't sure. Monica Ghosh has this report. Here in New Addington, the tram is used by commuters and school children alike, so the strike would have caused major disruption. It's been a year since the Croydon tram crash when seven people were killed because the driver lost awareness according to the findings from the Braille Accident Investigation Branch. New safety equipment with infrared scanners was installed recently, but side effects have been reported since the sensors were installed. I spoke to one driver who said his headaches were so bad towards the end of his shift that he felt unsafe driving the train. The strike was cancelled after an independent investigation was announced. These are tributes paid to the victims of the crash last year. They were laid at a memorial last week where there was a one minute silence. This is the commemorative bench unveiled during the day. Finn Brennan, the Aslip officer for the tram network, said that 
The decision to choose this system and start to install it without any discussion with staff or trade unions showed complete disregard for the view of their drivers. The next strike is still planned to go ahead on December the 3rd, and the families of the victims of the crash have expressed dismay, but the tram companies say they're committed to ensuring safety for both passengers and drivers. Monica Ghosh for ELL Plus. And finally, with the number of rough sleepers on the rise, the Project Wrap Up London has never been more needed. Over 8,000 people are said to have been sleeping on the streets of London last year. And with temperatures dropping as winter gets near, the charity has again been organising collection points at various tube stations. Thanks to the generosity of commuters, they've already collected over 1,500 bags of coats. Yubin Jiang reports. A typical foggy cold London morning. Some are running to work, some already take a break from work, but some don't even have a job to go to. People who are going to be homeless over winter months are really vulnerable. Wrap Up London is a charity whose aim is to collect codes for the homeless, refugees, children living in poverty, and people fleeing domestic violence. The wrap-up charity started in the U.S. and crossed the Atlantic to U.K. in 2011. In all seriousness, it's a really important winter campaign. Um, last year we collected 23,000 warm coats and we distributed them to people through 107 London community organisations. Every year we rely on between eight and 900 volunteers um, and they come from all over. We have children volunteering, we have students volunteering. Um, and you know, when I heard about it again this year, then I just decided, yeah, you should do it. Okay, so 115 just this morning, and it's not even 10 o'clock. So, so yeah, it's really great. Everybody's been very generous. Also, the volunteers can be recognized by their rag scarves. It's got a little heart, a little bit of heart there. So yeah, just promoting kindness and generosity and charity around the holidays. And while I was at Liverpool Street, I saw two people, two men, walk along, and they actually took their coats off and handed them over and walked on. So that was enormous generosity. Also, many other people really concerned about the homeless in London. I don't have much money, but I can't, I can't just walk past people and ignore them. I think sometimes a person will walk past a person who's sleeping rough and think, it's his fault, he's a druggie, he's an alcoholic, he deserves what he gets. But no, if you look, if you talk to them very often, you hear a story, and it would, it would shock you. In these two years, more than 8,000 people slept rough on the streets in London. Unfortunately, rough sleepers are 17 times more likely to be victims of violence. In addition to the counts of rough sleepers and the number of homelessness applications, it is thought that 62% of single homeless people are actually hiding homeless. This means they might be sofa surfing or living in unsecured accommodation. So they don't even show up in the government statistics. There are homeless people outside two stations. However, this event decided to distribute all the codes from over 100 charities rather than giving them directly. This is to ensure that all the things can reach the people most in need. They can collect them from the refugee shelters or the homeless centers. At the same time, they have access to many other services that can help them to review their lives. Yubin Zhang from ALL Plus. And if you've got an unwanted winter coat to donate, the last day for collections will be the 24th of November. That's it for now. Do remember you can catch up with all the latest on our website at www.eastlondonlines.co.uk. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you.